Hello and welcome to our Solvings Genetics Problems tutorial. Uh, this will just go over some basic uh, skills for solving some basic genetics problems. Uh, there's a couple videos here um, that can also help you with genetics. These problems that we're going to go through are uh, the first four problems on your part one of genetics problems uh, worksheet. Um, so, you know, there are four basic types or systems of inheritance. There's complete dominance, incomplete dominance, co-dominance, and sex linked. We're going to go through a problem for each of those so you guys have an idea of how to approach the problem. And then what we are also going to do is uh, talk a little bit about eye color because that one's tricky. Okay, so in dogs, wire-haired fur, which is also like hair, uh, is dominant to smooth hair. Okay, so right there in that first sentence, we're going to stop and we're going to write some stuff down because that sentence tells us a lot. Solving genetics problems is pretty much like solving word problems in math. Um, there's a lot of information in there and you need to sort through what's relevant and what isn't and it is really really helpful to make some notes to yourself okay so we know that wire fur is dominant so that means we're going to use an uppercase to represent wire or wired hair i'll just write wire uh, and a lowercase w to represent smooth because it is recessive to the wired hair so what does that mean? Uh, that means that a dog that is big W, big W, and a dog that is big W, little W, both of those dogs will have wire hair. Okay, and the only way to have a dog that has smooth hair is to be homozygous recessive. So you need to know those terms, right? So this is this one is homozygous dominant, this is homozygous recessive, and this one here is heterozygous. All right, so if a heterozygous wire hair dog is crossed with a smooth haired dog, what is the expected phenotypic and genotypic ratios? Okay, so first of all, this whole thing, expected gen phenotypic and genotypic ratios, uh, these are the uh, proportion of puppies with these different hair characteristics that you would expect if you bred these dogs many, many times over. So it's probabilities, and that's what we use the Punnett square for. It doesn't mean that if you have a small sample size, like you just breed these two dogs once, that you will necessarily get the ratios that you come up with with your Punnett square. It's just what we expect over time or over many uh, matings. Okay, so we're going to do a heterozygous wired hair dog. So heterozygous is this one here. So big W, little w is going to be crossed with a smooth haired dog. Smooth haired is little w, little w. I will say also that you can use whatever uh, letters you want to, but you just need to be clear about it. And it is very helpful if you pick a letter that you can clearly write as a capital and a lowercase. Otherwise, you can confuse yourself. It is also really important when you solve genetics problems to be very neat and tidy. Okay, so make sure you answer uh, your questions clearly, and I'll show you how to write that out. Okay, so you're going to make a Punnett square. Okay, uh, in this case, because it's not sex linked, it doesn't matter which parent is male and which mat, uh, which parent is female and also doesn't matter which side you put them on but remember what we're going to be doing is putting the alleles here right so this one uh the big w little w half of its alleles uh for its gametes excuse me we're going to be putting the alleles here for the gametes um half of its gametes will carry a big w and half of its gametes will carry a little w for this one because it's homozygous all of its gametes will carry a little w we put it down twice to help with our probabilities. Okay, and then, so these are the parents, right? And then in here are going to go the offspring, the genotypes of the offspring. So these are the genotypes of the uh, eggs or sperm, so the gametes, and this is the genotype of the other type of gamete. So one is an egg, one's a sperm. All right, so, uh, and then in this box, each of these boxes is worth 25% or one quarter chance. All right, so here we are going to take the big W and the little W, 
Okay, and here the big W and the little W, and this one will be getting a little W from both the egg and the sperm. So what does this mean? It means that there is a 25% chance that this big W will combine with this little W. There is a 25% that the same big W will combine with this other little W. Those taken together, of course, are 50% because 25 plus 25. And then we get the same down here. This is also 50%. Okay, so to answer our question, we are first, first going to write, you can write it in either, either order. We're going to write out the expected phenotypic and genotypic ratio or frequency. So you're going to write this this way. Big W to little W is 50% to 50. Oops, that should be a 5, not a 1. Find the eraser. Okay. You could also write it, you could write it various ways as long as you're clear, right? You could say, do it this way, up and down. That's totally perfectly acceptable also. You could also use, um, instead of percentages, you could use fractions, or you can use uh, proportions one to one. Okay. You just want to pick one of these things. I tend to just do it um, in percentages, I'm gonna erase this too. You just need to pick one way to do it. Okay, and that, so that's our genotypic ratio. Now we need to do our phenotypic ratio. So that's what they're gonna look like. These ones here will have wired hair, so right, wire. And these ones here are going to be smooth. And in this case, these also are a 50% chance of each okay and then that would be your answer it's really important to stay neat and tidy make your punnett square large enough so that you can read what you've written inside of it and present your answer very clearly associating the correct uh, percentage or fraction or however you've chosen to uh, to represent it with the correct genotype and the correct phenotype okay. it is also important to actually read what the question is asking you and not necessarily just automatically do uh, the phenotypic and genotypic ratio. So here is another question and when we read it we'll see it's not actually asking for that information. Okay, but let's start first. So hair texture in humans is an autosomal trait with curly hair incompletely dominant to straight hair. Okay, so this question is actually telling us that we are dealing with incomplete dominance. Remember those are the ones that the heterozygote individuals are going to have an intermediate or an in-between phenotype. Okay, um, and that would be something in between curly hair and straight hair, okay, which would be wavy hair. All right, so remember when you have incomplete dominance, you still only have two alleles, and but you have three phenotypes. For this, the notation uh, is a little bit different. So the most common way to do it is to pick some letter that represents the gene that we're talking about. So here we're talking about hair. So I've chosen H, you could choose T, you could choose C, I don't know, you could choose whatever you want. Uh, and then we're going to represent the different alleles as a superscript. So for this, H superscript C will be curly and H superscript S will be straight. Okay, notice what we don't have is we don't have a wavy hair allele, right? So the way to get wavy hair is to have one of each of these alleles. So also additional information to write down. And all of this is like background information that once you have written it down, um, you can refer to it when you answer the question and it will be very helpful for you, okay? HCHC will be curly, HS, HS will be straight. and H, C, H, S will be wavy, okay? And that's how you know we're dealing with incomplete dominance because these ones that are heterozygous, they have one of each allele, have an in-between phenotype. All right, now that we have that information, we can go ahead and answer our question. So a curly-haired woman had children with a man with wavy hair, okay? Let's just write that down. So a curly haired woman, she's going to be this. So she's going to be H superscript C, H superscript C. And she is going to, so this X means crossed or mated with. She is going to have children with a man with wavy hair. Okay, wavy hair um, is H C H S. 
Okay, so first of all, I'm going to pause and go back for a second and point out that it doesn't matter in this question that the woman is curly haired and the man has wavy hair uh, because it's not sex linked, sex linked. Okay, this word right here, autosomal, means that it is on one of the 22 chromosomes that are not the sex chromosomes, not the X and not the Y. Uh, and so it has nothing to do with sex determination. So it's actually extraneous information that it's the woman that has curly hair and the man that has wavy hair. It doesn't matter which, okay? So don't let that confuse you. One of the things that confuses people when they first start doing genetics problems is extraneous information like that. If they read man and woman, then they start thinking, oh, I need to put this on an X chromosome, but you don't, okay? So we're going to uh, do the same thing as before, put the alleles for the eggs and sperm, okay? So these, of course, are from the woman, so they're going to be eggs. Doesn't matter which side you put it on, but both of, um, but she just has one possibility, HCHC, -H -C, right? Uh, and then the man with his wavy hair, half of his sperm will have an HC and half will have an HS, okay? And then we're just going to do our cross. So this HC could combine with this HC, giving an HCHC child, okay? Or this HC could combine with this HS, giving an HCHS child. And then because the woman can only make HC eggs, we just get the same thing down here. Okay, so what do we see? We see that we have a 50% chance of HCHC and a 50% chance of HCHS, right? So this is 50 and this is 50, okay? I'm not writing out the genotypic and phenotypic ratios because actually the question doesn't ask that. So it says if they had, so they had 16 children, how many of the children would be expected to be curly haired? Okay, so now you're going to take the ones that are going to be curly haired and which ones are those? These are these ones. Right, so we would expect half will be curly and half would be wavy. Uh, if they had six ch 16 children, we would expect that they would have eight curly haired child children. And that would actually be the answer to this question, not this information here, okay? Although this, we use this information to add, answer the question. All right, um, feather color in chickens is controlled by one gene with two codominant alleles, okay? So again, this one is telling us that we're dealing with codominance. Again, with codominance, we have two alleles, but we have uh, three phenotypes, okay? So we have black feather allele and white feather allele. So again, we're going to use the superscript, so I'm going to pick F for feather, and then I'm going to say F superscript B, is black feathers. I'm just going to write black. And F superscript W is white feathers. Okay, so that's some information to write down. And then further, we want to write down what the different genotypes, um, what phenotypes they're associated with. So if someone is homo or if some chicken is homozygous for the black allele, then that chicken will have black feathers. Okay. Or if they are homozygous for the FW allele, then that chicken will be white. And actually, I forgot to say all of these examples that we're going through here are true. Uh, so this is really some real chicken genetics. Um, and then if a chicken is FBFW, so heterozygous, what is their phenotype going to be? So we're dealing with codominance, and that means that we're going to see both alleles in the phenotype. Um, so you would see uh, feathers with black and white spots or stripes. We'll just say spots. So there are chickens who have black and white uh, spotted feathers. Okay. Different uh, than if it was incomplete dominance, because if it was incomplete dominance, we would think that these heterozygotes um, would have uh, gray fur, right, a combination. Or if it was complete dominance, we would think that they just had black or white, whichever one was dominant. Okay, 
So if a black feathered hen, which is the female, is crossed with a white feathered rooster, which is the male, what are the expected genotypic and phenotypic ratios for the offspring? Okay, so once again, we are not dealing with something that's sex linked. It doesn't say anything about being sex linked in here. So that means that we can actually just ignore that that's the female and that's the male, right? And just say, okay, we are crossing a black feathered chicken with a white feathered chicken. Of course, one is male and one's female. That's the way it works, but it doesn't matter. We don't need to do any X linked chromosomes. Okay, so we're going to cross a black and a white one. So we're going to cross an FB, FB with an FW, FW. Okay, without even doing a Punnett square, you might be able to figure this out, right? So the, oops, the black feathered female, all of the eggs that she will produce will carry the FB. Why? Because that's all she has. She doesn't have any other allele, okay? So she will make all FB. Uh, same with the rooster. He only has FW to contribute, so he will only make FW sperm. Okay? And that means during when those participate in fertilization, we would get baby chickens that are all FB, FW, okay? You don't have to do it that way. Um, you can. Probably more uh, official would be to do a Punnett square. Okay, so we can do a Punnett square. That's supposed to be a B. Uh, we can do a Punnett square also. W, and then you will find that you are writing F, B, F, W four times, right? Meaning that 100% of the offspring will be F, B, F, W. Okay, and so for to answer the question, the genotypic and phenotypic ratios, we could write, um, so this one's pretty easy, 100% F, B, F, W, black and white spotted offspring. And that's the answer to your question. Oops, I did not do a very good job drawing that circle. Try again. There we go. All right, that's that one. Okay, last we're going to do an actual sex-linked one, okay? Notice that it actually says sex-linked in it, okay? It says, in humans, male pattern baldness is caused by a recessive sex-linked gene. Okay, so here we know, what do we know about sex-linked genes? We know that they are on the X chromosome, but they are not on the Y chromosome, okay? Remember that females are XX and males are XY, okay? All right, um, okay, so male pattern baldness is caused by a recessive X-linked gene. Okay, so that means the recessive one we're going to give a little B to, and that's going to be bald. Okay. And then the opposite of that would be not being bald, and that's the dominant allele. Not bald. Okay. Um, and then we need to think about what the different genotypes um, and phenotypes would be, right? So for women, um, they have actually three possible genotypes and, um, and two possible phenotypes. So women could be X big B, X big B, or X big B, X little b, and both of those uh, would be not bald because they have at least one copy of the big B allele. That is a big B. Um, and then a woman could be X little b, X little b, and in that case she would be bald. She has to be homozygous recessive for that. Okay, males are a little different because they are they only have one X chromosome. They always get their X from mom. Um, if they got a big B from mom uh, and a Y from dad, then they are uh, not bald. They are a not bald man. But if they got an X little B from mom and their Y from dad, then they are bald. Okay. Um, so it's a little different for males because they only have one X chromosome. So whatever is on that X chromosome is what they're going to, what, that's what they get. Okay. And that's why sex linked genes show up more often in males because there's not this masking effect. These ones here that um, have both the dominant and the recessive allele and don't have the, the phenotype associated with the disorder um, are called carriers. Uh, carriers 
can are often applied uh, to sex linked genes, but don't have to always be right. So you could have with the sickle cell um, disease, you could have one copy of the sickle cell allele and not show the disease, but you would be a carrier for it. Okay. All right on. Okay. Imagine that a man without male pattern baldness. Okay. So we're going to cross a man. So he's going to be X, Y. Don't forget that males are Y. The Y does not have the allele on it. So we never write a letter next to the allele for the Y. Remember X is a big chromosome and Y is a little tiny dinky chromosome. And when we're talking about the X linked genes, we're talking about all these genes that reside up here on parts of the, um, the X chromosome that the Y chromosome does not have. Okay, so um, we're going to do a male without male pattern baldness. So that means he's going to be X big B. And we're going to cross him with a woman who is a carrier. So if she's a carrier, she's going to be heterozygous. So X big B, X little b. Okay, um, and then we have some questions. What are the chances they'll have a male child with male pattern baldness and what are the chances they would have a female child? Well, in order to answer those, we need to do our lovely Punnett square. Okay, here it does matter that one's a male and a female, but what doesn't matter is which side you put them on. Okay, so I'm gonna do uh, the man down here and the woman up here and she's heterozygous, okay? So first of all, let's notice that for uh, half of, expected half of this man's offspring would carry the Y chromosome, okay? If, um, uh, and those would be the boy children, because they have the Y chromosome. They get their Y from dad, that means they have to get their B, or excuse me, their X from mom. Okay, so we would see that half of the bees have the big B and half of the boys have the big B and half have the little B, okay? For the females, they, because they're XX, they're gonna get an X from dad and from mom. And these would be the girls or the females. Okay, so when we are doing, I'm gonna see if I can, this thing will not let me change color. It's interesting. Um, when we are doing sex linked genes, we often think about the girls separately from the boys or the males separately from the females. Okay. So if we look just at the girls, okay, we would say that the um, genotypic ratio is X big B, X big B to X big B, X little B. Okay. And just of the girls, uh, that is 50% to 50%, okay? Because we are only looking at the girls, so ignoring the boys right now, each box turns into 50%, okay? So half of the girls are would have X big B, X big B, half would X, have X big B, X little B, okay? But all of the girls would be not bald. So not bald would be 100%, okay? Oops. Um, and then let's do the same thing for the boys. So for the boys, we have two genotypes, X big B, Y, and X little b, Y, okay? Same thing here, we're not gonna look at the girls, we're only gonna look at the boys, so each box is 50%. So 50% of the males would be expected to carry the big B, and 50% would be expected to carry the little b. Big B means not bald, and little b means bald, okay? And here, we also expect a 50 to 50 ratio or percentage, okay? All right, so now we have all the information, we finally answer the question. So what are the chances they would have a male child with male pattern baldness? Well, that would be here, right? So there would be a 50% chance of X little b y, okay, and that's saying out of the male children. If you were saying out of all the children, what's the chance they would have a male child that is bald? That would be 25%, okay. Um, so what are the chances they would have a v female child with male pattern baldness? Well, they don't have any children that are X little b, X little b, so there's a 0% chance of X little b, X little b for these two parents. Okay.
Okay, so those are the four uh, just kind of main examples to get you started. And then I want to go over the eye color one. Uh, you might want to go back and listen to this again when you're uh, when you're doing that part. It's on the second to last page of the part two of the genetics problems of the complex genetics problems. Um, the eye color one tends to be a little tricky just because you're dealing with two genes. Okay, um, so here are, are some hints, and then we're going to work through an example that's not in your worksheet. Okay, so first of all, you do not need to do any Punnett squares. So that would be involving a dihybrid cross instead of a monohybrid cross, meaning we'd be looking at two genes at the same time. We're actually not going to do any of those, uh, but you don't need those uh, to solve this. Okay. So just like uh, solving any genetics problems, the first thing is to write down everything you can, okay, about the genotype of each person. And you're gleaning that from the information that is presented in the problem, okay? Here, remember that we are looking at two genes, both the OCA2 gene and the gay gene, so that each person has to have two alleles for each gene. So you're going to have four total. So that's more than we have been normally. So you're going to write down everything you can, and then you're going to work backward from the offspring to the parents. So uh, if that's what it's asking. So often those questions are being asked. Here's some key information. Um, you can glean this information from lecture uh, but, or also from the information that is presented in your worksheet, but it's a little less clear, okay? So for brown eyes, you just have to have one big B, and that means for this allele here, it could be little b or big b and for this allele here, remember that would be the g or the gay allele, it could be big G or little g, and the last one could also be big G or little g. So there are lots of possibilities for brown eyes. The lecture goes through all of them, but the key thing is just having one big B and anything else gives you brown eyes. Okay, with green eyes, you have to be, uh, have to not have a big B. So that means you have to have two little Bs. You have to be homozygous recessive for the OCA2 gene. And then you need to have at least one big G for the gay gene. Okay, and your second allele could also be a big G or a little G. Okay, and that's because the big G is dominant over the little G. Okay, you could also write this just leaving a blank here, like I have here. Okay. Uh, blue eyes is often the key. So blue eyes has only one genotype. You have to be homozygous recessive for both of those genes, BB, little b, little b, little g, little g. All right, so here's an example. Okay, a woman with brown eyes and a man with green eyes have two children. Again, does not matter that we're dealing with a woman, a man. Of course we are, it doesn't, but it's not sex linked, right? So we're just thinking, so one parent has brown eyes, one has green eyes. Okay. One child has green eyes and they have two children, one with green eyes and one with blue eyes. And we want to know what the genotypes of the woman and the man are, okay? So we write down what we do know. For a person with brown eyes, we all we know is that they have a big B. These other alleles could be anything, okay? The man has green eyes. So for the man, we know he has to be uh, little b, little b, big G, big G, or little b, little b, big G, little g. And so what we want to do is try to fill out as many of these unknowns, and we want to determine which the man is, okay? So one child has green eyes, so the child with green eyes is in the same situation as the, uh, the dad, and so we're just going to leave that as a blank rather than writing it this way. Remember, you can write it this way too. And child, um, child two has blue eyes, so, oh, whoop. On. My cat just sat on my mouse, literally. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Oh my. Hold on. Thanks a lot, kitty cat. Okay, let me go forward and move the mouse out of my kitty cat's range. Okay, uh, child two has little b, little b, little g, little g. We know that because that's the only genotype that's associated with blue eyes. Okay, so we can tell some stuff based on this information. Right. What do we know? Well, we know that, uh, and we're just going to basically use the blue-eyed child to figure stuff out. So blue-eyed child got a little b from mom and a little b from dad. Clearly that child got a little b from dad because he only has little b's. But what isn't so clear is that, because remember this could be a big b or a little b, having a child that has a little b from both parents means that the woman has to have a little b for that allele. Okay. And then the other thing it tells us is that 
the uh, child got a little g from both parents, okay? What that tells us is that the man has to have a little g, so he must be little b, little b, big g, little g. He cannot be this. If he was this one, then the child would have a big g and have green eyes, like this child. Um, and then, so it means got a little g from the man and also a little g from the woman, okay? What it doesn't tell us uh, is what is this? right? So that could still be a big G or little g, and either way the woman would have brown eyes, and actually our information here is not going to tell us anything. If we knew, uh, like is there any way that we could tell? I don't know. That'd be really hard to tell, right? So anyway, the only thing we can discern now is that we know that the woman is big B, little b, big G, little g, or big B, little b, little g, little g, okay? And that the man is definitely little b, little b, big g, little g, okay? So I hope that this tutorial has been helpful for your uh, solving genetics problems. Remember, you can always email me questions as well.